words. Uh, it is my uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, our senior our grand senior warden senior grand warden uh, Rick Kayser, who will be our co-host for tonight. Right, worshipful sir, the floor is yours. Thank you, right, worshipful brother Thompson. Um, I would reiterate what uh, right worshipful brother Jake just said. Um, welcome everyone to the third installment of the Grand Lodge of Missouri's Bicentennial Lecture Series put on through the auspices of the Missouri Lodge of Research and of course our grand historian, right, most worshipful brother John Hess. Um, this should prove to be a very interesting discussion tonight, I think. Um, to those of us who are uh, very interested in the history of Missouri's ritual, um, we are going to uh, have a have a as deep a dive as we can on an, on an untiled Zoom call um, into some of the history of how our ritual um, came about and specifically the Baltimore Convention of 1843. Um, and I know that as I was coming up through Masonry, I heard about the Baltimore Convention, but uh, not a whole lot about what actually happened at the Baltimore Convention and Missouri's uh, strong ties to that convention. So it's gonna be a very enlightening evening for us all, I think, this evening. Um, our, uh, our guest lecturer tonight, um, I get to introduce him, though he's already introduced himself to all of you, um, because it is none other than our own Right Worshipful Brother Jacob Thompson. So um, as Right Worshipful Brother Thompson said, please uh, remain muted through the presentation. If you have a question that comes to mind and you want to throw it into the chat, by all means do so. We will address those at the end um, or stick around at the end and uh, we will have it open for questions and answers at that point. So without further ado, uh, Right Worship Brother Jacob Thompson, please enlighten us. Thank you, uh, Greetings, brethren, and good evening. Uh, tonight's presentation, uh, before I kind of dive into the topic, uh, just to set a couple things for anyone's concerns or thoughts, uh, all the material I'll discuss, it can be found in easily ready to find sources um, produced by the Grand Lodge of Missouri uh, or several other noted uh, Masonic historians. Um, none of this stuff is, is out of a secret archive or anything like that uh, in that way. Um, within that being said, this is untitled. Um, and this is actually part of a much larger presentation uh, that I've developed about the history of our ritual. Um, we're going to do a small bit of it tonight, and we're going to skip over some things uh, and not go into as much detail. But if it's, it's something you have an interest in, uh, by all means, there's going to be several ways for you to explore it later on in the, in the coming year. Uh, or if you'd like me to come speak to your lodge or something, reach out. Before I go any further, I, I do need to give a little bit of credit on the topic of this subject to, to a brother um, who's no longer with us. Uh, this presentation originally was part of uh, a presentation I gave uh, to my Allied Masonic Degrees Council. Um, and it came as the result of an argument I had with uh, worshipful brother Christopher Tilly. Uh, brother Tilly passed uh, a little over a year ago, um, but in my discussions with him one night, uh, after several libations, we argued about the history of Missouri's ritual, and he claimed that it had to do with Jeremy Lag Cross, and that was the answer to everything because Chris was a big cryptic mason, and we all know Jeremy Lag Cross and, and cryptic masonry. So, so he and I argued about it for a good hour and a half, um, and the next day I started work on this presentation to prove him wrong, um, and I did, uh, and he gladly admitted it publicly when we did the presentation afterwards. So uh, that's who brought about this presentation. It would be only proper that I at least mention that because um, he was a big driver when I started working on this. So with that being said, we'll bring up the slide deck and begin. Right, worshipful brother Rick, do I have slides on your screen? Awesome. So 
The title of tonight's presentation is The Baltimore Convention, The Reaffirmation of Webb's Work and Missouri's Place in It. Uh, this being the early untiled ritual history of the Grand Lodge of Missouri and the, and the lodges that uh, participated in its work and, and those brothers who are a part of that experience. So we all know that early Masonic ritual comes under different uh, guises, different understandings. One thing that's extremely important whenever you're reading about ritual in masonry um, or any type of degree work or anything is a very clear distinction of the words ritual or mode of work. They are two similar but different things and they're interchangeable um, having kind of overlapped each other. And in general, you can find it in early versions of our constitution and early proceedings, they refer to a mode of work. Ritual isn't really a, a word used as much. Mode of work is the phrase of choice because ritual wasn't always standardized. So a mode of work was the blueprint you worked within. Um, ritual was much more rigid, structured. You know, there's a pattern to it. Um, so anytime you're looking at early ritual, early Masonic history, uh, keep in mind mode of work and ritual are the same thing, generally speaking, uh, but they have a difference in the level of activity, if you will, uh, of what's involved. But why is that important? Well, keep in mind that our ritual has evolved from something extremely simple and um, operative. You know, the, the earliest versions of, of ritual we can find of a Masonic degree, if you will, uh, involve a historical introduction. The brother is presented the charges of a Freemason or of Freemasonry, um, depending on what constitution he is held to. He's then given those ancient constitutions and regulations. That could then be followed by a early catechism, uh, a system of Q&A, questions and answers. Our, our early brothers, when they lectured a candidate, it wasn't so much done with a tracing board perhaps all the time, as much, much as it could be done around a dinner table with a, with a pipe and, and a nice tankard of ale and they're discussing and having a back and forth, trying to show who the smarter brother was, if you will, uh, based on their retention of the ritual. So that's where the early idea uh, of our ritual comes from. And that's the earliest points you know, we can find and we can argue that back and forth. But where does Missouri's ritual come from? Where do we find the origins of what took hold here in the Grand Lodge, Missouri? Well, if we look at the role and the roster of early Missouri Masons, we notice a couple things. We see some very strong influences from Virginia, Tennessee, Pennsylvania, and Kentucky. Uh, a lot of brothers from those areas are involved in early lodge operations and administration work. Uh, the first three lodges, of course, who came to together to found the Grand Lodge uh, had Tennessee charters. Um, keep in mind, though, brothers, that doesn't imply that the ritual used in those lodges was Tennessee work. They just had a charter from Tennessee. Uh, the work of those lodges very much could have easily resembled the origins of the brothers within the lodge. Tennessee was just the closest Grand Lodge to which they could make connection and they had relationships mm -hmm. with. And we know there's a little bit of that mixing about because early proceedings show us some of that Pennsylvania influence. Um, we see it in some of the phrases, the jurisprudence practices of the time and the nomenclature. You know, early grand masters addressed the grand lodge meetings, the annual communication, and they talked to brothers as ancient York Masons. And that reference is used several times. Uh, and it's not just for the first couple of years. We see it popping up for the first decade and a half or more in some ways um, with that reference. So this idea of multiple Grand Lodges coming together, being a melting pot, um, a bit of a win in Rome method of ritual is very possible um, because each jurisdiction worked its own way. We know that now, but there was a very unstandardized existence in, in Masonic ritual at the time. There wasn't a, a rule book by which people would wag their finger at you uh, and say, well, that's not exactly how it's supposed to be, uh, especially if they came from a Grand Lodge that was much more of a mode of work jurisdiction where you had paths and you, you knew the words to say, but how 
certain parts of it function um, was kind of left to your discretion. Now, even though we know that there's some of that early work from those other jurisdictions where brothers are involved, we know that some of the more standardized work of the United States, if you will, and the jurisdictions was coming into Missouri. Now, what I mean by that is that in the late 1700s, early 1800s, uh, the work of William Preston took off like wildfire in England. Preston uh, came in, edited and reworked some of the ritual and the, the practices of the lodges in England. Um, and, and over time, of course, that crossed the ocean. Thomas Smith Webb, uh, an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial soul as he was, uh, got a hold of a copy of Preston's work and made his own corrections um, and his own adaptations to it, uh, and then began to teach that work and print his own monitor. Um, and it became very popular. Uh, but Webb uh, became, became one of those itinerant lecturers that we often hear about, these, these brothers who were very skilled, very knowledgeable in ritual, who would travel about, and your lodge would pay for their room and board, and they would visit with your lodge for several days or even a week and teach your lodge the ritual and the work. Um, and Webb was part of that group. He, Jeremy Lagcross, several others were involved in that. And of course, Thomas Smith Webb, his real, real big thing that he was heavily involved with was uh, Templary. He had his fingers in a lot of the American Rite bodies, Royal Arch, the Council, uh, and then later the Commandery. But he and Jeremy Lagcross, who was a huge proponent of the Council, were traveling around. And as they were traveling, uh, they were teaching brothers the ritual and that type of thing. So we know uh, from at least several accounts by Frederick Billen, that in 1816, Missouri brothers were in Cincinnati and Louisville. And when they were there on those occasions, uh, they met with Webb and Cross and they obtained and carried home with them uh, a correct knowledge of the Master Masons, Royal Arch, and Royal and Select Masters degrees. Now that's interesting. They carry that back, uh, presumably to St. Louis is the tone of the text. Um, we do know, of course, that in 1816 or shortly thereafter, uh, we, of course, have the early Royal, Missouri Royal Arts chapter number one, and, of course, uh, Saint, <clears throat> some of the early St. Louis craft lodges forming. Uh, the Royal and Select Masters, the cryptic councils, didn't really solidify their place in Missouri till, till quite a little bit later, uh, as the Grand Council wasn't formed until the 1860s. Um, but why is all that important? Well, that gives us an idea of the roots of some of our ritual, that we have a connection to Thomas Smith Webb, uh, that, that we're Missourians who were taught it and brought it back. But there's another side to this coin. It wasn't just potentially a small group of brothers. We know for a fact that Brother George H.C. Melody, uh, Wright Warsh Brother Melody, um, had been taught directly by Webb or potentially one of his proxies, although general uh, sources make it pretty clear it was probably Webb. Uh, and he was taught by Webb while in Albany, New York. Uh, Brother Melody was extremely influential in the early years of the Grand Lodge, highly involved in some of the early footsteps uh, and actions. Um, and he was appointed Missouri's first Grand Visitor or Grand Lecturer. So that tells us that at least in Missouri's earliest years, we had a mix of rituals, a mixed bag of, of states that were probably working something that was akin to uh, Virginian uh, work, Pennsylvanian work, uh, with the heavy, heavy influence of Webb as it, the Grand Lodge grew out of the St. Louis area early on and, and kind of moved to those areas where brothers had, had moved and immigrated to. We don't hear a lot about ritual though, between that early 1820, 1821 point uh, until the 1840s. Our, our, we don't hear a lot about it in the proceedings. We hear that, you know, the, the grand visitor is being sent to lodges and there's some action here and there, or there's lodges that are working in the high degrees that are not supposed to, um, or there are lodges conferring uh, master mason degrees and entered apprentice lodges and fellow craft degrees and master mason lodges. There were a lot of just intriguing things going on. 
1840, though, we see a resolution offered to invite uh, a brother by the name of Barney to Virginia. Uh, now, Brother Barney is a student of Thomas Smith Webb. Uh, he was very well known at the time, very active, and he was requested to come and deliver a course on Masonic lectures. That was in 1840. We really don't see it mentioned again. So uh, I'm not entirely sure if he ever made it to Missouri or if he ever picked them up on their offer. Uh, but the next year, we do see an interesting re resolution passed that there needs to be a committee established to determine the mode of lecturing and working in the several degrees of entered apprentice, fellow craft, and master mason. So that right there tells us that there's some vague questions about our ritual at that moment. That perhaps certain lodges are working in, in one jurisdiction and others in another. Um, that there may not be a lot of continuity and standardization, which is fairly par for the course in, in early Masonic groups. And it is what it is. In that same year, we see a resolution charging the district deputy masters to know the work and be capable of teaching it. I also find that that line interesting in itself that they were charging the DDGMs to, to take an active investment in understanding the mode of work and the ritual. And if you are to look, even now today, in the Green Lodge's constitution and bylaws, if you look under the duties of a D district deputy grand master, you'll actually find that it does note that the district deputy grand master uh, should be able to, and I'm gonna terribly paraphrase this, but that the district deputy grandmaster is charged with correcting errors in the mode of work. Uh, and that mode of work probably, as long as that line's been there, is referencing this much older idea than it is anything generally administrative, which we may trend our minds to. So 1840s, early 1840s, there's a lot of things going on. Um, Obviously, we just talked about those resolutions, those actions where they're talking about standardizing the ritual, perhaps in Missouri, finding a way to make sure that the work is being taught by knowledgeable brothers. But what's going on in the background? Well, the 1840s is kind of on the tail end, but it's, it's not completely out of the woods of the anti-Masonic period. Um, you know, the Grand Lodge had, had slowed down. A lot of lodges had closed up in the 1830s and then were, were popping back to life in the early 1840s. But that whole idea of anti-masonry had really shaken the foundation of some of these lodges. These brothers had, had sifted away, um, good or worse. Uh, according to Albert Pike, anti-masonry was the best thing that had ever occurred in some ways to masonry, because uh, he said it, it shook the wheat from the chaff. But out of all that comes some questions. How, how are the Grand Lodges going to move forward? How are we going to restore our ranks? How are we gonna ensure that the brothers entering our lodges aren't anti-Masons? They aren't people picking up uh, Bernard's uh, light on masonry. They aren't guys picking up these exposés. They are knowledgeable and true brothers. So this idea of uniformity with the ritual uh, across the board is, is really one of the next steps that these Grand Lodges see and these Masonic leaders consider. Um, and as part of that, there's this huge push that we need to return to the accurate work of Thomas Smith Webb. We need, to, we need to go back to what's right, and we need to make sure everybody is doing what Thomas Smith Webb said is the ritual um, and, and how he brought it in for, in, from the Preston format over, um, which by this time, many Grand Lodges have put their own spins on things. They've made their own shifts and changes. So those driving factors push the ball to lead to what is known as the Baltimore Convention. But before we talk about that convention, we need to backtrack just a minute and, and briefly touch on who Thomas Smith Webb was and why everybody was so infatuated with returning to his work. Smith Webb was born in 1771. He was a bookbinder by trade uh, and was initiated and raised in New Hampshire. In his Masonic career, he, he runs into a brother on a St. John's Day feast who had heard the Prestonian lectures, had a copy of them. And Webb puts himself up as an apprentice to learn the work under this man, and, and he gains this knowledge. Uh, of course, there's some people who say he just got a copy of Preston's book. But uh, he takes that knowledge, and two years later, he publishes his mon monitor, the Freemason's Monitor or Illustrations of Masonry. 
From that point on, there were seven editions of that book selling 16,000 copies in the first 10 years alone. Um, and it spread like wildfire. It was a monitor in the United States. It was received well. He was able to make connections uh, through some of the other Masonic bodies he was involved with. And as such, he was able to get out and about and, and get this monitor in the hands of brothers who are needing instruction, who are needing to know the ritual and the work. And, and thus it, it spread like wildfire. And of course, the way they work with those, uh, you could have the monitor, uh, but learning the rest of it, you had to learn it by ear. And so there were those interactions where brothers would go spend a week with Webb or a week with Barney or one of his other students and basically have to follow them around and, and work with them. And he would lead them through that. By 1813, he was elected the Grand Master of Rhode Island. Um, he was pretty heavily involved, like I said, in, in the uh, General Grand Chapter, as well as the Grand Encampment in its early years. And he died by 1819, shortly before the, the Grand Lodge of Missouri was formed. So that's the guy who, who lays the foundation of the ritual. Anti-Masonry, uh, the anti-Masonic period, this push to be uniform, so to protect the craft, starts a fire. And in that same year that Missouri starts to scratch its head about uniformity, the Grand Lodge of Alabama makes the call and they say, we want everybody to meet in Washington, D.C. in March of 1842. We're going to come up with a uniform mode of work. Well, Missouri never got that notice. Uh, and I don't think a lot of other states got the notice because nobody really showed up too much. Uh, at the time, 10 Grand Lodges showed up. They looked around, they realized that for what we're here, uh, everybody seems pretty uniform, but there wasn't enough participation for them. So they felt they were hindered and their hands were tied. So they then decided to basically make an announcement and pass a resolution as a convention that every Grand Lodge should appoint one or more brothers who are skilled uh, to come to this meeting where we can, we can settle this and move forward. They set the date for the next year uh, in May and hoped that lodges would hear the call and Grand Lodges would send representation for their jurisdiction. Missouri, of course, like I said, missed the boat. Um, we didn't really ever receive the resolution from Alabama, so we didn't send a delegation to the Washington Convention. Yet, because other states were talking about it, the Correspondence Committee picked up on it and they made a mention of it to the Grand Lodge, and at which point uh, the senior grand warden, right, Warshaw Brother Joseph Foster, uh, decided that Missouri needed to do something, and he prepared a resolution uh, asking the Grand Master to appoint a representative to be authorized to act on behalf of the Grand Lodge and to go to the convention and that they be paid with funds from the Treasury. Uh, the Grand Lodge moves on this. They think it's great, and in doing so, they get a crew together. Um, the initial, the official representatives that were going to be sent were Colonel Stephen Webster Barnes Carnegie and uh, Joseph Foster. Both of these are extremely influential early uh, Missouri Masons. Both of them are well-known ritualists, uh, and both of them uh, either were at that point or would later be past Grand Masters of the Grand Lodge. Those two men, uh, that's two for the price of one because the Grand Lodge in the end, the Grand Lodge only sanctioned sending one individual, yet they said the two could go in official capacity. The reason the two could go is that Foster and Carnegie agreed to split the cost. So the Grand Lodge would still pay for one man, but Foster and Carnegie would pay the other halves out of their pocket. Uh, they were followed, though, by two other brothers, Frederick Billen and Hiram Chamberlain, who paid for the entire trip out of their own pockets to go and to help represent the Grand Lodge. Noticeably though, our Grand Lecturer didn't attend at the time. Alexander T. Douglas um, had moved to New Orleans due to his health. Uh, so he wasn't even present at the, the annual communication when they had it. Uh, and, and he shortly thereafter fades from proceedings in general um, after and as an effect of the Baltimore Convention, which he did not attend. So, that was in October of 1842. 
By April of 1843, right before the convention, the Grand Lodge sends out an order, uh, or at least publishes one at their semi-annual communication saying that the Grand Visitor stops teaching ritual. All schools of instruction, all ritual instruction is paused until the Baltimore Convention is over and the work is obtained from that. So at this point, the Grand Lodge decides and makes a conscious decision that we need to put everything on pause, at least in terms of teaching anybody anything, uh, until we know the true course. If we're really going to keep this uniform ritual and, and really bring the lectures back to where they're supposed to be. So, of course, a couple weeks later, everyone heads to Baltimore. They met daily except for Sundays from May 8th to May 17th. Represented Grand Lodges included Alabama, D.C., Florida, Missouri, Mississippi, New Hampshire. You can see quite a list. It also included as a visitor uh, one brother who is a past uh, district deputy grand master from South Wales is where he listed his Grand Lodge at. But there's more to this. The men they sent to this convention weren't just your average brothers, and not to sound mean with that, but they sent the best of the best that they could find at the time who were engaged with the ritual. Men who were involved in various Masonic bodies who had been around a while with this idea that hopefully, if you get that much experience, maybe they can find that true work. So it included one grandmaster, two past grands, two, one past deputy grand, two senior grand wardens, grand secretaries, past secretaries, the deputy grand master of the grand encampment, and then there were three additional visitors. Um, so they, wanted, they had a broad stroke uh, and a broad stripe of the craft here in, in terms of representing various levels of engagement, uh, years of service, and, and leadership understanding. So these brothers come together, but you have to ask yourself, if this convention is, is all about getting back to Thomas Smith Webb's work, was anybody there who actually worked with Thomas Smith Webb? Well, nobody was. The old guard, the traveling lectures who learned under Thomas Smith Webb, um, none of them made a, a, a general appearance um, other than John Barney, who we mentioned earlier. Um, and, and we know Barney was a contemporary, uh, not so much a direct student, uh, but he was there representing uh, the Grand Lodge of Ohio. He was basically a grandson in, in terms of Thomas Smith Webb's work uh, because he learned his ritual from Gleason or Fowl uh, in 1817 after they had studied with Webb. Uh, so he was as close as they got. The grandson was as close as they got to having somebody present uh, at the meeting who was a direct student that, that everybody knew that was a household name um, because these traveling lectures uh, like Gleason, Fowl, Barney, Webb, Gladcross, uh, these were well-known names. They were highly involved in various other bodies. Um, and so really, it's interesting so much that Barney was, was the only one there. They begin to work. And as this convention picks up, they come up with two primary purposes. They're going to find a uniform ritual, and they're going to recommend measures that they see will elevate the order. Remember, Part of the reason for this convention is anti-Masonry. Part of the firing cannon there. So they're gonna find ways to elevate the order. They're gonna find a uniform mode of work. They set up four committees. One of them is gonna work on jurisprudence. Another is gonna look at consecration and installation ceremonies. Somebody's gonna look at funeral services and somebody's gonna look at the work and lectures of the degrees. Our good friend, most worshipful brother Carnegie gets one of the better picks um, and he is placed on the committee of work and lectures in conferring the degrees. Uh, and he sets himself to that task with several other noted brothers. Convention moves forward. And as committees meet and they come to a solution, they would come back and meet together and exemplify the work. So they get, you know, done with reviewing the first part of the inter-apprentice degree. They'd all get back together, exemplify it, discuss what, what was right, wrong, and different tweak it, go again. Amendments were then considered to the work and they would review it portion by portion uh, with exact care. 
Now, with all this going on, you have to wonder, what, what did other people think? Uh, what did the other participants think of the convention? Well, we know that a brother by the name of Charles Moore, who was from the Grand Lodge of Massachusetts, an honorary member of the Grand Lodge of Missouri, tells us that after he saw everything happening at the Baltimore Convention, he came up to a, a couple conclusions. He says the work and lecture of the first three degrees, as adopted by the convention, with a few unimportant verbal exceptions, is literally the original compiled by Thomas Webb. He tells us that the changes that occurred, the little ones, are mostly verbal, few in number, and not material in the result. The only change of consequence was in the due guards of the second and third degrees, which were changed made to conform to that of the first degree in position and explanation. The analogy was incorrect. Now, what does all that mean? Um, not to dig into it too much, uh, but basically, there were some situations with the arrangements of the due guards and signs that we know of in ritual. Uh, there also was a lot of cross-contamination is probably the easiest way to say it, uh, between the term Dugard and the term sign. They were interchangeable. They were synonymous. They didn't mean separate things. They could mean the same thing. And so you had issues where actions were added or taken out, or there wasn't really a, a functional progression, um, nor did the term mean the same thing in each degree. So you may call something a do guard in one degree, you get to the other degree and its equivalent is now a sign. Uh, so that's some of the work that they cleaned up per se. Um, in particular, uh, he tells us that the entered apprentice sign and do guard are flipped. The fellow craft sign uh, was not two parts, but one. And the master masons ver uh, work only involved one hand. Via the Baltimore convention, the use of two hands in general was adopted for all three signs and do guards to make more sense and, and to be integrated in such a manner uh, it was uniform. And another big additional change uh, is the jewels. The immovable jewels and the movable jewels were actually flipped from what we now know them uh, in the Preston Webb work. Up until that time, the rough ashlar, perfect ashlar and trestle board were considered immovable jewels. Uh, and the committee recommended and adopted it be the square level and plumb, reasoning that the three jewels are assigned to three principal officers and they're unchangeable in that they can never be worn by an officer of a lesser rank except by proxy. Now, the big win that Missouri had in, this, in, in all these uh, changes was business, business only being transacted on the master mason degree. Missouri was a huge proponent of this. They saw it as the best only option to keeping out anti-Masons, to keeping out Cowans, uh, to hiding how cool the minutes are and how fun bill reading is, this is their solution. Um, business could only be transacted on the Master Mason degree. And, and as such, uh, Missouri had already been doing that for some time. They were able to win over several other states and that became a recommendation of the convention. Some additional changes we've mentioned uh, already, but the other big one is the Blazing Star, uh, which shows up in, in the Entered Apprentice degree, generally speaking. Uh, at the time, it was spoken of as a commemoration of the Star of Bethlehem. That was stricken out, the reference to the Star of Bethlehem, uh, in particular because it was saw as being only referencing to the Christian faith. So, how does Missouri respond to this convention? What does Missouri do? Well, that happened in May. This is still in a time when Missouri had a semi-annual communication in April and an annual communication in October. So a couple months later, we're having the annual communication. Uh, Brothers Carnegie, Brother Foster, Brother Billen, and Brother Chamberlain show up. They're the delegation, of course. Uh, Chamberlain and, and Bill and not as the official delegation, but they were there to give their comments. The Missouri delegation, so that's Foster and Carnegie, begin to exemplify the ritual. They begin on Friday at 10 a.m. and they go till 2 p.m. They then pause and start at 7 p.m. again and go into the evening, demonstrating the inner apprentice degree. Now, if you think about how much time that is, because they don't tell us an ending time, uh, but they spend quite a bit of time just doing the inner apprentice degree. 
The next day, they start at 10 a.m. again, and they demonstrate the second degree and the first section of the Master Mason degree. The report was then placed before the craft, um, and it was adopted without a dissenting vote. Now, there is a little bit of a, a, a sneaky part about that. The, the records say it was adopted without a dissenting vote, but a brother left the room before the vote. Brother Chamberlain, who was present at the convention, left the room, uh, at least during one of those votes. Uh, didn't state a reason why, didn't state an objection, uh, but he left before the vote was taken. Um, the only really one of anybody to have left at that point. Um, but a committee was then tasked to review the proceedings of the convention after that resolution. And they report back that we find that they have stripped the work and lectures of the gaudy trappings introduced to make fame for the inventor. They've restored our sacred institutions to its primitive simplicity. I think that says a pretty fair bit about where ritual might have been before this point in Missouri. Uh, it perhaps hints that the brothers who brought that early work in, whether they learned it from Webb in, in 1816 or they had it from their own jurisdictions, had created a meld of things that, uh, as the committee says, gaudy trappings introduced to make fame for the inventor uh, or innovator, excuse me. And as such, uh, many felt that the Webb, Preston Webb work as introduced at the Baltimore Convention uh, was pure, it was clean, it was what it needed to be. Uh, the end result of that convention, of course, uh, Most Worship Brother Carnegie is appointed the Grand Visitor or the Grand Lecturer, and he sets about teaching the work. So the next year, all this ritual, all these committee reports were bound up in a book and they're published, and it's called the Masonic Trestle Board. It's the monitor of everything they did. And it's endorsed. Many, many of the members who participated on the committee endorse it, uh, including most worshipful brother Joseph Foster. Uh, and it has the backing of brother Benjamin Gleason, who was not at the convention, but was a direct pupil of Webb. Um, so they had, it had a lot of power behind it. Um, um, committee here in Missouri reviewed it though. And they complimented it its excellencies, but they found defects. And the crossing of opinions created a majority and a minority report that failed to adopt the text. So Grand Lodge of Missouri received the Masonic Trust Board as a monitor. They sent it to a committee to review it, and that committee was split. A majority and a minority opinion uh, over these excellencies and defects. But what were these defects? Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but it's important we circle back to exactly what was adopted in 43 and 44. Missouri adopts the Baltimore Convention ritual work, but they reject the monitorial. 43, they literally vote and accept all the ritual work and then they toss the book out. Uh, what is important to note is while they adopted that ritual, uh, the second section of the Master Mason work was not adopted. The second section of the Master Mason is, it's not mentioned in the proceedings, uh, but the second section was not adopted from the Baltimore work. We kept what we felt was appropriate. And of course, they appointed Brother Carnegie as the Grand Visitor, who was present at Baltimore. He was key on that committee. Uh, so if you're looking for the best and most qualified, they put the guy right in the place. Now, what are those defects? What are those things that, that rankled up the committee? Um, well, they said, well, and, and this is, most of this is not even to say they said, this is the truth. Uh, they included several charges in the book that were not at the convention. Uh, the brothers who compiled the book uh, just put them in there. Uh, they included a section titled on qualifications and duties of candidates and Freemasonry, which came from Dermot's Amon Resin. Uh, which many Grand Lodges do not use. Uh, they use Andersons. So there was some angst about that, uh, Grand Lodge Missouri included. Uh, and there was some serious objection about the manner of opening a lodge as was listed in monitorial form. Uh, they listed out these three uh, declarations 
uh, that would be used. And, and there was some severe objection to opening an EA degree in the name of God and the universal benevolence, open the fellow craft on the square in the name of the great geometrician of the universe, and the master mason on the center in the name of the most high. So these are the defects. Um, what's interesting is Missouri had problems with this. Uh, we had a committee who had, didn't care for these defects, uh, but Brother Carnegie, who they had just appointed to be the grand lecturer, helped draft the book. He was part of the crew that put it together. So we adopt the Baltimore work. We throw out their text. Um, a couple of years later, the Grand Lodge receives a book from Jeremy Lag Cross, um, and they pass a resolution to adopt it as the Grand Lodge's monitor, um, and it be the textbook of the Grand Lodge for the benefit of its subordinate lodges in the work and lectures adopted. Um, so. We accept Webb's work. We take Jeremy Lycross's book. Um, of course, that now places us front and center locked in with the Baltimore Webb work uh, being Missouri's ritual. And, and as the years go on, there's of course a lot of issues uh, with growth, uh, with uh, stubborn attitude perhaps, and, and with uh, just general head scratching uh, because the grand lecture system there isn't always an opportunity back then to get a grand lecture to each lodge. There isn't a DDGM system yet in place. Um, so there can only be active reaffirmation, active pushing to have the grand lecture, if possible, reach those lodges, and stressing the importance of the uniformity of the ritual. By 1856, Most Worshipful Brother Love S. Cornwell tells us uh, that it is to be lamented that our lodges have been under the necessity of receiving work from irresponsible authorities, growing out of the fact, no doubt, that the Grand Lodge has failed to give them instruction that they reasonably expected. Our lodges need instruction, and in their zeal to obtain it, they have been led to seek it from unauthorized sources to such alarming extent that I deem it of vital importance to prohibit the practice by special edict. Um, so much so was the adoption of this ritual uh, not taking hold that the Grand Master is, is, is just floored. He's appalled by the nature of it. Um, and, and in that year, they lay out specific specifications for the Grand Lodge uh, in much more thorough formatting than ever before, with the goal that within three years after 1856, there will be uniformity of the work and the lectures across the state, no questions asked. Now, of course, three years after 1856, uh, we're about to head into the Civil War, so <laughs> things kind of go down the tube there anyway. But you can see Missouri rolls out this ritual uh, because the Grand Lecture isn't able to make it everywhere, because lodges are kind of languishing about with it. They're seeking monitors from other jurisdictions. They're seeking other texts. They're seeking irresponsible authority, uh, brothers who are not knowledgeable or skilled to teach the work, and they're bringing them in uh, out of kind of own their own desperation. So that's 1856. Two years later, um, we find this great quote that I just love, and I don't know why it cracks me up, but Most Worship Brother Foster, Right Worship Brother Daggett at the time, Most Worship Brother Brawls, uh, Rawls, uh, have a report because, you know, we had that three-year uniformity goal, and we're a year before it's out, and they put this report together on the uniformity of the work, they mentioned that there needs to be a district school of instruction to teach brothers. And they say, if we could deal with our brethren elected to preside over subordinate lodges as we do with children at school, compelling them to get their lessons, then the desired object of strict uniformity could probably be obtained. I also thought that was a little harsh and it kind of made me chuckle when they're comparing lodge officers to children at school. Um, but very much this idea that we need to get brothers to, to knuckle down a little bit and, and really push this. Uh, of course, the same time, they also suggest that the dis state be split into six districts for the 176 lodges of the year, and they need to have a district grand lecture oversee each one. That recommendation did not pass. We get towards the middle of the Civil War, and by this point, there is a resolution offered again, because for some reason, it just still hasn't sunk in. 
to people that the ritual they're being taught is the correct ritual and it, it, the emphasis isn't there. So there is a proposal put before the Grand Lodge that basically reiterates that our Grand Lecturer has almost died. He has traveled all over the state. He has, his health has suffered, his time has suffered, and he has, he's reached as many lodges as he can. So we need to make sure you understand that his effort is important because he's teaching you the work and the lectures that were presented at this Grand Lodge in 1843 by Carnegie and Foster. It is the right work. There is no question about it. Don't object to it uh, because you still had lodges pushing back. A couple of years later, uh, Most Worshipful Brother Dunscombe reiterates the same thing. They're still finding uh, brothers, uh, some of them, he says, old and experienced ones that deny the work of the Grand Lecture as the work adopted by the Grand Lodge and the same as is known as the work of the Baltimore Convention. Um, he isn't happy about it, and, and it's at this time period we do see the lecturer system uh, adopted within those years around that point, um, hoping to bring some more direct instruction. Because what you find is often mentioned with these earlier grand lectures, the fact that they can't get what they call out state. They can't get to rural areas. Uh, traveling far off a rail line is not always convenient. Um, and so what you're finding is, is these old experienced past masters, old experienced brothers who've done work forever, always this way. Uh, and they don't believe that the grand lecture is teaching the right thing. By 1874, we find out that, uh, interestingly, there still seems to be some issues, uh, some more entertaining than others. Uh, the grand lecturer that year reports that he thinks lodges need to do more general adoption of music in the ritual, uh, particularly for the opening and closing charges. Uh, and then he also complains about the dropping of the use of prayer in the opening of lodge, uh, and that that needs to be restored. Over time though, the work shifts. It, it doesn't shift so much in that we see it change, but we see the people teaching it shift. And as it goes farther and farther out, uh, we see it getting farther and farther away from that point uh, of the original convention, the original attendees. Yet the Grand Lodge of Missouri consistently, and you can find it about three, every three or four years, reaffirms that we do the Baltimore work and the Baltimore work is in place. and and you can tell that there's still angst about lodges not adopting it. By 1932, uh, Most Worshipful Brother Ravy Denslow in his address tells us, our customs, traditions, landmarks, they've been handed down to us unchanged by time. And while there may be a number of inconsistencies and many suggestions for improvement, yet I am confident the best interest of our fraternity will be subversed by permitting no innovations in its ritual or established customs. Um, I get a kick out of that quote because uh, in his own memoirs, he tells us in the uh, late 40s, he highly petitioned for ritual changes <laughs> uh, that he got. Um, by 1853, Most Worshipful Brother Rummer tells us that the long existing policy of this Grand Lodge is that once the ritual is established, it should be uniformly applied throughout the state. So with all that being said and that reaffirmation uh, of the ritual over time, we have to ask ourselves, who are the men who are actually teaching the work, who were involved in its instruction. Missouri's grand lecture system is, is interesting in so much uh, that its evolution has been a standalone job and a, and a job that has also held uh, excessive responsibility and power in, at some points, being very much a position of not only ritual teaching, uh, but administration very early on. While there was a, a grand visitor appointed early, from 1821 onward, the first time they're ever listed as a Grand Lodge officer is 1826. By 1856, we learn that the Grand Lecture is hereby expressly forbidden to teach any other work than the three degrees of ancient craft masonry, together with the qualifications, ceremonies for a brother to be elected the, to the Oriental Chair, the past master's degree. Uh, why does this come about? Well, you could scratch your head for a couple reasons. Uh, at the time, uh, the grand lecturers who had been involved were involved in several other Masonic bodies. So there was generally a concern about uh, not so much 
time allocation, but responsibility and making sure that the grand lecturer is only working for the grand lodge. He's not also conferring work for the council or the chapter uh, or teaching that type of effort. He's only doing the work uh, that he is set to do um, and thus not polluting it or anything like that. The district lecturer system as we now know it didn't come around until the 1860s. Up until that point, it was just the grand lecturer. Interestingly though, over time, the Grand Lodge would appoint an assistant grand lecturer. Uh, and that position was from time to time uh, and occasionally would fall out of use and then be brought back and fall out of use and be brought back. Uh, the regional grand lecture system that we now have is kind of that midpoint between the district grand lectures and the uh, grand lecturer himself didn't come around until the early 2000s. So through a succession of ages, our transmitted our secrets, our lessons and, and our practices. Why we keep our rituals so much in our hearts is, is because of that connection perhaps, because of that mentorship and, and that link. Um, with Missouri being a mouth to ear state for such a long period, uh, we see the importance and the relevance of it. You also see some interesting connections. Our first grand lecture was George H.C. Melody who stayed in office from 1822 till 1840, a direct student of Thomas Smith Webb. Of course, the next year we had brother Alexander Douglas. He was replaced by brother Carnegie, uh, who was later replaced by brother Hurley. Hurley was a neighbor of Carnegie's, lived next door to the guy more or less. Uh, of course, Melody came back for a year. And then we see a brother by the name of Charles Levy. Brother Levy, uh, is a neighbor and a frequent associate of Joseph Foster, a brother who is present at the Baltimore Convention. Again, we see Brother Melody back and Brother Foster again. So we see early on a very strong connection that you either knew somebody who participated actively in the Baltimore Convention, or in George Melody's case, you knew Thomas Smith Webb. Um, over time, that trickled down further. We still see Levy, Foster, uh, we know Anthony O'Sullivan was a close associate of Joseph Foster's. Uh, John F. Houston is an interesting situation. Um, he was just a year, but we generally can say that his interaction with O'Sullivan would make sense there. Uh, and then Thomas Garrett, uh, another interesting situation, uh, past grand master. He's not included in some list as a grand lecture, uh, but he is listed at least in one of the officer tableaus. Um, his inclusion as a grand lecturer is very interesting because uh, he is believed to have been a conservator. Uh, and the conservators were the uh, quite unliked and quite unwelcome in the state of Missouri uh, during their existence. Um, but it is also said that he potentially developed the Masonic funeral service that now exists in our monitor. Um, Most worship brother Dunscombe, kind of the same situation as Thomas Garrett. Uh, he's listed in some places as a grand lecturer, others not. From him, we see J.H. Lampton, Alan uh, McDowell, who was a pupil of O'Sullivan, and then some of the more recent lectures up until the 50s. Now, how does that all interconnect uh, as we go forward? Well, really, at about that point of the 1950s, uh, at that transition point from most Worship Brother Inner to Right Worship Brother Freeland Hadley, we see kind of the end uh, of the direct student connection. Uh, when we talk about lecturers and we talk about so-and-so learn directly from X, Y, Z, uh, and, and there's kind of a trickle down and you can map it. Um, so much so that, and, and there's some more modern faces in here just to make sure you're all still awake. And if you can name everybody in it later, uh, you'll get a free prize that doesn't exist. But this shows us a pretty good sketch of how these men were connected. Um, Thomas Smith Webb taught George H.C. Melody. We know John Barney was potentially involved in Missouri Ritual as well. And, and all of that funnels to the Baltimore Convention where we see uh, Stephen Barnes Carnegie and Joseph Foster who had their own pupils. Anthony O'Sullivan learned it from Foster and Carnegie at the demonstrations and afterwards. And through him, Lampton, Houston, Dunscombe, all were present or involved. Alan McDowell, a direct student of O'Sullivan, who then taught Anthony Entner and James McClanahan, taught both of those brothers. And that's kind of the ending point of a direct tree per se. And there may be more trickle down with some of our more recent 
grand lectures, but this is kind of the upper half of that tree. So last couple tidbits just to share with you for some context and some interest. Uh, ciphers, codes, trussel boards, and manuals. Um, this is one of those things that I find interesting. Uh, first off, if you ever look at the history of Missouri ritual, um, it's very hard to find anything if you go to our proceedings. Very often you'll see a grand lecture report that the nature of the discussion is esoteric and will be demonstrated and not in writing. Somewhere around the 1980s, 1990s, uh, we began to print a little more clear in our notes um, for one reason or another. But the idea of a cipher, a code, a trust board in Missouri has been something that's popped up and then popped away very briefly and, and on, only on short occasions until recently. 1857, uh, which is after we received that book from Jeremy Lag Cross, uh, we see this interesting entry in our Grand Lodge proceedings. And we're told that whereas the uniformity of the work and the lectures is essential to the best interest of Freemasonry, et cetera, et cetera, our brother, George Melody, past deputy grand master of this jurisdiction has a great expense uh, and both time and means put together a series of charts forcibly illustrating the symbols of the first three degrees, well calculated to facilitate the desired object. Therefore, we are resolved that the enterprise of our brother is presented to the lodges in this jurisdiction, as well as promote uniformity in the works so much desired by us all. And then be, they be recommended to avail themselves of this aid afforded in his pursuit. So we basically find that the Grand Lodge adopts the work of Baltimore, other than the second section of the Master Mason. They reject the Baltimore Convention's textbook, if you will. They adopt Jeremy Lag Cross's textbook. And then a couple years later, they adopt the charts uh, for instruction from George Melody in-house. Now, Beyond that, we really don't see any discussion about a monitor in Missouri um, in monitorial form. But we see right at the turn of the century, we start seeing references to Parsons Monitor. John Parsons was a well-known regalia um, maker and, and involved in the regalia business and fraternal supply in St. Louis. Um, and he produced a monitor, which became very popular in the state right at the turn of the century. By 1908, the Grand Lodge decides we need to come up with a monitor. We need to copyright it. We need to have it published under our control to be our authorized monitor at a price that we determine with the profits going to the Masonic home. So they go to research Parsons monitor. And what they find out is that, and interestingly enough, brother John Parsons is a part of the committee revising this monitor and reviewing it himself. They find out that his monitor, or what's called Parsons monitor, um, there's some uncertainty about it getting printed again. There's some issues. Uh, they're not really sure who has the copyright on it. Um, Parsons was just kind of producing it, <laughs> turning a buck and, and helping brothers as he could. So as they scratch their heads on this, they make some decisions. They decide that it's impossible for them to come up with a, a good way to secure Parsons monitor. So they're going to get a new copyright. They're going to invest it with the Grand Lodge, um, and they're going to recreate it all. What's interesting, though, is they go through his monitor, and they make their corrections that they think need to be done. They list two and a half pages of wording, spelling, and formatting changes. Ending the report, they say that your committee further requests that have given authority to make the changes uh, both in the monitor and work. So they don't want to change just the monitor. They actually want to change the ritual too. They want to change the words Mason and Masonry to Freemason and Freemasonry, wherever in the opinion of your committee, the same would be advisable. So they went and made a blanket change through the work that, that was adopted as it stands. Another interesting early part of the craft is the degree of past master. Uh, we discussed this earlier uh, in a presentation a month or so ago. Um, the history on it is pretty murky. We, we know, of course, that our early jurisdictional relationship with Pennsylvania uh, shows some affinity to the idea of conferring the chair degree. A lot of jurisdictions have a chair degree. Missouri's has, has since kind of disappeared 
It was originally a prerequisite to preside over a lodge. And of course, the Grand Master himself was installed in a lodge of past masters. Uh, and generally, the communications of the Grand Lodge were held in such lodges uh, up until the 1850s or so. The practice for installing that Grand Master ceasing in 1853, and the practice of the past master's degree disappearing in 1894. There were issues with it, of course, because as Royal Arch chapters grew, they're conferring a virtual past master degree. There is concern because there are brothers who are demanding the rights of being an actual past master. Uh, by 1875, most worst brother Luke uh, puts out some very clear words about who is a master and who isn't. Um, and, and so you see over time, the ceasing of that past master degree being used. Uh, when they abolished it though, they basically, made it very clear and, it, and it's part of the ceremony of installation now that the new master must promise to acquaint himself with the work and lectures of the three degrees of ancient craft mason. Uh, he has to acquaint himself with that. So some other really brief tidbits. Uh, this is, when I say early Masonic ritual, this really isn't. Uh, balloting and, what, and reception of distinguished guests both of the forms we now are going to talk about have only been around uh, for under 100 years, but they're interesting and they're tied to a ritual just briefly, so I thought I'd touch on them. Um, in 1936, the Grand Master at the time informs us that there had never been a definitively prescribed ritual for balloting on petitions. There are certain similarities that all the lodges have, but there's others that have great divergence. Uh, he basically says, you know, that is what it is. We have a lot of lodges who'd like to have a uniform version. Um, it would not be devising of something new, but a careful selection of what seems best from all the other sources. Uh, that language is around and nobody picks it up. Uh, so much so that by the 18, or 1950s, a committee is formed. It develops and tests a balloting procedure. Um, it sends it out to lodges uh, and it does well. Uh, the Grand Master in 1859, or 1959, though, uh, states he has some issues with it. He thinks it's a waste of time and effort, uh, and he felt that it would harm the lodges individually. So it got held over, and, and it kept rolling along for a little bit, uh, as it had been rolling on for some time. The next year, Most Worship Brother Harold O'Grawl bought that proposal to the floor uh, and basically said, we need to either prove this or, or kill it. One or the other, let's, let's talk about it. And he said, he felt that it would be a great benefit for your smaller lodges. It could help control some of the chaos. Uh, and there were some interesting remarks made. Uh, a brother by the name of Kitchell stood up and he said he wondered why after 140 years, we finally discovered our system of balloting is all wrong. Uh, most worship brother Jane, who was from around the Hannibal area, uh, told everyone that I think we probably outstayed or more in need of a system of balloting are balloting possibly than they do in the cities. We are not so fortunate enough to have a circuit judge in our lodge that can keep us straight in these matters. Um, I'm pretty sure he's taking a jab at, at, at most worship brother Aronson and, and several of the comments Aronson had made just before that. Uh, either way, the motion comes to the floor, it's passed, and in 1960, the form of balloting on petitions we now have is adopted. The reception of distinguished guests is another intriguing piece. Um, that same year that Most Worship Brother Entner mentions the potential of balloting, he also talks about the fact that there's no prescribed way to receive the Grand Master. But if you want one done, I can make it. That's basically what he says. Uh, that languishes. And that goes on the side. There is one developed. It gets exemplified. It gets put aside again. Um, and we really don't hear a lot about it until 1983, when we're told that it was unanimously agreed that the reception should be recommended for adoption as ritual at the 1983 Grain Lodge session. And upon adoption, this entire ritual should be printed in our next printing of the manual. Uh, right Worship Brother Stanton Brown then states at the conclusion of his report that on the point of the reception of distinguished guests with the Committee on Ritual, we did recommend or have recommended in total unanimity. Each district has been exposed to it. It is essentially the reception that has been taught in Missouri for over 20 years. So Most Worship Brother Inner brings it up, he suggests it. They developed a plan, they developed a reception ceremony. They started teaching it 
but it, it kind of kept rolling through the hamster wheel and was never adopted. Uh, and it took till 1983 to be officially put into sanctioned use. So I'll close it up with just a couple real brief comments on changes. Um, as I said, up until 1992, uh, you really don't find a lot of in-depth explanation of what's exoteric and esoteric, doesn't matter, from our committee reports on ritual. So a lot of times we don't have a lot to go on when we want to know about the history of our early work. Yet we can find interesting comments. In 1926, we were told that the saluting the flag had no place in ritual. In 1936, they told us the ritual committee, uh, their report isn't, is, is brief, but it's not because it's brief in nature and we haven't done a lot. We've just been doing a lot of things that are secret and confidential and we don't want to put it in print. By 1944, the Grand Lodge barred the use of slides in connection with the fellow craft degree. Uh, and then it decided the duties of the junior deacon, what they were, but it didn't want to print them. So that, that tells us that the junior deacon may, may used to do some more fumbling around than he thinks. Uh, by 1965, uh, the Grand Master decided that the Quran is permissible on the altar, but for a candidate, for a candidate, but it cannot be on top of the Bible. Uh, and I share this one with you because I got a kick out of it a little bit when I scratched my head because uh, we all wonder. But Right Worship Brother Freeland Hadley at his retirement in 1972 stated in his report that since the adoption of the Baltimore work, everything's pretty much been the same except for a couple little things. He tells us in the late 1800s that the officer's duties were removed from a fellow craft and master mason opening. So they used to be included there. There were a couple paragraphs in the fellow craft lecture that were X'd out, and there were two words and a deletion made in one of the degrees. Doesn't say what they were. But as he concludes it, he says, it is my privilege and pleasure to know, and he lists off a bunch of the old grand lectures before him, who learned from right worshipable brother McDowell, and that there has only been a few minor changes authorized by this grand lodge. This takes the history of our ritual back 100 years to my satisfaction and it adds another link in the chain connecting Missouri's work with the work prescribed by the Baltimore Convention. And of course, uh, because some people will get a kick out of this, in 2012, the Ritual Committee clarified pronunciations. It's uh, shooed and showed, not showed, it's shooed. Uh, Herman, like Herman, not Herman, uh, and Bo, like you would bow before someone. Uh, just because I know someone, I can rile up with that statement, so. Um, with that being said, uh, there are some other changes we know of. We know other things crept into the work over time. So the purity of saying the Missouri work is a direct descendant of the Baltimore uh, is pretty solid with some, some little shaky changes. Uh, right Worship Brother McClanahan, Right Worship Brother Freeland Hadley, uh, and others who made comments uh, publicly and otherwise expressed what those slight changes were. But in the end, do we still use it? Do we still use the Baltimore work? Of course we do. Uh, Freeland Hadley told us in 1954 that the days of the degree mills are about over. The members are enjoying the opportunity to take part in Masonic activities. There is much more to masonry than ritual, yet it is very important. It is the hub, so to speak, on which the activity of the fraternity revolves. Where the ritual is good, the light of Freemasonry burns bright and masonry prospers. And in the few places where there is a lack of interest in the ritual, other Masonic activities are suffering. A couple years before that, Most Worshipful Brother Bradford tells us that he cannot escape the conclusion, however, that there is a growing tendency to stress unduly the importance of ritual, this losing the sight of the real purpose of Masonry. The ritual is not Masonry, and ritual proficiency alone does not make a man a Freemason. Furthermore, Masonry would not long survive as a dominant spiritual and moral force were its only purpose conferring degrees. Both of those quotes show us interesting perspectives, but they all build to the importance of the work. They all build to the importance of what ritual does for brothers, where it can transport us and where it can move us uh, in understanding our craft and understanding our fraternity. The Baltimore Convention as an action and as an event, uh, set the course for lodges to find that uniformity, to help standardize the modes of work 
to help standardize those forms of recognition and practices and, and build a foundation on that many lodge, Grand Lodges and many lodges are still practicing on today. So with that, thank you. And we'll open the floor for any questions or, or comments. Before we do that, Jacob, uh, I would like to thank you for another excellent presentation. Um, and before we kind of open it up and people start leaving, uh, I would like to acknowledge that we are uh, doing this lecture on one of our uh, Masonic occasions on the St. John the Evangelist Day. Um, and we should all keep that in mind. And if you don't mind, I would like to just read the last part of the Tyler's Toast for us all so that we can kind of remember what, what we're doing here today. Dear brother in the mystic tie, the night is waning fast. Our work is done, our feast is o'er, this toast must be the last. Good night to all, once more good night, again the farewell strain. Happy to meet, sorry to part, happy to meet again. And with that, we will open it up to questions if someone wants to go ahead and unmute themselves and ask it or uh, bring it up in the, uh, in the chat, that's fine. There haven't really been many questions come up during the presentation in the chat, but we can certainly address them now. All right, let's see here. Um, we have one comment here, Brother Robert Jackson says, I missed uh, what was John Barney's tie to Webb? Uh, they know he was Gleason or Fowl. He learned from both at varying points. Um, his connection to the convention, uh, generally speaking, uh, wasn't. Um, I believe after the fact he was involved, um, just kind of supporting it and saying it was okay. Let me double check what I've got here. No, Barney was present. Excuse me. Uh, Gleason was the one who actually, after the fact, said the work was in line with uh, would have been taught earlier. So that's that's the connection there. Bar and Barney had been invited to Missouri, like I said, with that resolution. We don't know if he actually made it here. Um, I'd be curious to see if, if any of the earlier uh, lodges in the St. Louis area had anything on that. Um, the invited uh, seems to have been, there was an argument regarding the ritual in the St. Louis area, go figure. Uh, and because of that, uh, they were trying to call in a knowledgeable lecturer to, to sort the wheat from the chaff, if you will, uh, and bring some understanding to it. Um, so, uh, I'm going through the chat hey, here. Jacob, Joey G asks, were members of the old guard not in attendance due to protest or had they passed away or were otherwise not available? So that's a good question. Um, and that's actually one that I, I'd like to do a bit more looking into on the whole. Uh, several of them were gone. I mean, Webb died in 1819. Um, this was also an official quote unquote event. Uh, so you could have visitors and guests, but a lot of those guys were itinerant lecturers. They made their money off visiting lodges. Uh, so them going to a, a large function uh, unless they were supported by a Grand Lodge like Barney was representing Ohio, uh, they could find some friction potentially there uh, in terms of the interaction. Uh, but there were several that had already passed away. Um, there were several that just weren't, they weren't Grand Lodge officers. They weren't associated with any Grand Lodge other than they were a member of XYZ Lodge here and they traveled about. Uh, and that's how they made their money. Um, basically conferring work for some of the more independent side bodies that still existed. Uh, you know, Jeremy Lag Cross uh, was very heavy into that type of thing, um, spreading some of the other bodies of masonry. Uh, so you had interactions like that, but this was generally speaking, this wasn't a thing that there were posters on every street corner. It was very much a sanctioned type event. They wanted representation from a Grand Lodge. They, they weren't just going to your Jim Bob on the street because a lot of those guys like Gleason, Fowl, Barney, they could get hired to be your grand lecturer and they could do that for a while, but they weren't uh, long-term in a lot of ways. They were, they were there to help restore your ritual, solidify your jurisdiction's work, and then they would shift off somewhere else. Looks like we're getting some questions in now. Um, 
Philip Moss asks, how is the ritual changed? Is there a mechanism in place for submitting changes? I would default to you, Ryan Warshall. <laughs> you, you can give that explanation in a much better fashion than I would. I will certainly attempt. I would have liked to have had the grand lecturer here to be able to answer that himself, but um, there is no mechanism for changing the ritual because ideally the ritual should not change. Um, the grand lecturer and the ritual committee's responsibility is the preservation of the ritual. Um, there are instances where um, different parts of the state may be doing things slightly different than other parts of the state. And then it becomes the responsibility of the ritual committee to look at it and say, well, what's the right way to do it? If these guys are doing it this way and these guys are doing it that way, can we get to some finding what the, what the correct way of doing it is? And typically they will look back at, at guys who have done the ritual and done it well for a long time. Um, I know that uh, most of the more recent grand lecturers who have had it had him as a uh, as a resource have consulted uh, Right Worship Brother Stanton Brown because he was grand lecturer for a long, long time and knew the work extremely well. Um, now that that resource is not available, um, they they have other sources that they have to go to, but. You know, their, their main job is to preserve the ritual. So actual changes to the ritual are not done. Um, however, there are clarifications that will come from the committee from time to time because certain areas of the state do things one way and certain do another. And we really can't have that either. So I hope that answers the question. And to, to follow up on that, like I said, this is a, it didn't seem short, but the, the true version of this presentation is much more academic and longer. Uh, which is probably a delight. You all don't have to sit through it. But part of that is discussing some of that methodology to the idea of how those changes are manifested in writing. Because you can go through the proceedings and see what can be written down is there. And it is a lot of it's very much in the idea of, you know, one state does it just slight, or one part of the state has just done it slightly a little different and now somebody's scratching their head to make sure that they're doing it the right way. Um, and those changes and those systems have evolved. Uh, in the 30s, there was a discussion uh, about switching to a board of custodians at one point, uh, where they were basically going to shift away from a grand lot, a lecturer system with so much, and you would have a board of custodians uh, who would keep the work. Okay. Uh, and next up. It would be kind of a little different in the system. Sorry. Um, next, most worshipful brother Hess would like to know, with all the conflict politically between North and South and East and the New West, do you think the convention was also called to unite Freemasonry across the country? Yeah, I think I think reasonably that's that's a, a background motion point to it that would make a lot of sense. It, it, the big primers, of course, that everybody talks about is the idea of anti-Masonry and uniformity of the work and getting back to that because uh, we had seen through the 20s and the 30s and right leading up all these itinerant lectures We've seen all these other issues, but um, when you hit that point, uh, especially right at the early 1840s, um, you know, we saw what happened in the Grand Lodge, Missouri with lodges disappearing and, and things shutting down with the anti-masonry in the 30s. This is about the point that everything starts to swing back for a lot of Grand Lodges. So I think the idea of unity is, is big in it. Of course, there were also pushes for a general Grand Lodge. Uh, generally speaking, that was kind of the second that talk came up most of the Grand Lodges would back away quickly. Um, so the idea of everybody coming together for the ritual and uniformity and that type of thing was a good cloak to at least get everybody to sit at one table, shake hands, make those connections. Um, as, as I mentioned in there, Charles Moore from Massachusetts who made comments on the committee uh, and its proceedings um, became very good friends with Foster and Carnegie and was, is a, I shouldn't say what, is, was uh, and is a honorary member of the Grand Lodge of Missouri. He was elected a member uh, shortly thereafter. So um, in, in that connectivity, I, I think you saw a lot of those bonds made. Um, there was a lot of that engagement there. But uh, outright, I don't think they were going to say uniting Masonry um, just because of the, the pushes for General Grand, a General Grand Lodge had happened before that and after, obviously. And when you did that talk, people didn't go because that's losing their autonomy. Right. Most worshipful brother Tim Thomas asks, what influence, if any, did Mackey have on our ritual? I have in my hand an 1867 copy of Mackey's Masonic Ritualist. It gives credit to Webb, Sickles, and McCoy. 
It was sold by a publishing company in Kansas City, so would have been available to Missouri Masons. It covers entered apprentice to select master. Yeah, so that's that, and that's exactly the aisle I was going with earlier. Most forceful when I talked about we have that blank space of time where we know like they they endorsed Lads Monitor, but they never talk about it again. And then you know we get up to the turn of the century and they're talking about Parsons. Um, it's it's very reasonable uh, for some somebody to pick that up off the shelf and use it. Uh, very much like the uh, the book that nobody in Missouri owned. Ooh, that's very cool. That it was called King Solomon. I, I'm sure there's no one on this call who ever owned one, but it's very much like that. You know, there, there was an availability to them. Um, you had good publishers who were doing quality stuff, um, and, and reasonably, if everybody's working the web work, uh, the monitorial stuff should be pretty, pretty close to use. Um, and somebody did ask what a monitor was earlier, and maybe I should have clarified that out. Uh, monitorial, a monitor or monitorial work is, is the stuff that can be plain text. Generally speaking, it's a little blue book we have in Missouri that says Masonic Manual of Missouri. That's, that's what a monitor is. So it has some of those longer parts of ritual that aren't considered esoteric uh, that can be in full print. Um, but yeah, and, and with Mackey's involvement on that, most worshipful, it makes absolute sense that it would go from EA to select master um, just because of how he was with printing because he also did uh, the manual of, of, of the chapter in the cryptic manual as well. I mean, he did he did manuals and monitors for other bodies, so it's it's not out of the realm that he was trying to market. Um, although that's that, I find that interesting that he gives credit to Webb Sickles and McCoy because Sickles um, was out of the Pennsylvania area, and McCoy was of course uh, at the time McCoy had publishing in New York. Um, because McCoy did a lot of the early Scottish Rite stuff with Pike out of New York, so. Okay. Um, Edward Manukian wants to know, did Andrew Jackson have any influence on this as well? That's an interesting question. Um, Andrew Jackson, uh, past grandmaster of Tennessee. I've never seen anything that directly would point to his involvement in any of this. Um, early Missouri ritual, likely he had some play into it. Um, I think, uh, Right, Worship Brother Ty can maybe talk to some of the early connection between uh, Missouri Masons and the Grand Lodge of Tennessee and that relationship. Uh, but there was some slight, there was definitely some connection there because of Jackson and some of his military ties uh, with Missouri Masons that, that could easily have led to Tennessee work coming in. But in terms of being related to the Baltimore Convention, I don't know how much his hands would have been tied to any of that at that time. Uh, right, Worship Brother Ty, you want to? Uh, Andrew Jackson was senior grand warden of Tennessee when the uh, approval to form the Grand Lodge of Missouri actually uh, was created in 1821. Uh, Andrew Jackson felt very strongly that, um, I'm sorry, he was senior grand warden in 1816. Um, he felt very strongly about Missouri because of what Missouri did for him in the Southern Theater and the Battle of New Orleans. And, you know, it's a sad state when you, you read Frederick Billen's work and it says the men returned to find their lodge extinct. And, and Jackson felt very responsible for that. But as far as the work goes, I don't know of anything that Andrew Jackson was really involved with the work itself, other than just the exposure to Tennessee, which was North Carolina, and which brings us back to the moderns. Thank you. Uh... Byron Hams wants to know, if esoteric work was not put in print, how did you find out what it was? <laughs> Isn't that a head scratcher? Mouth to ear. That's how, that's how they had to work with it. You know, uh, for, for this paper, for anybody who's ever interested, if you want to look more at the Baltimore Convention uh, and, and some of the early ritual musings, if you will, um, obviously you can troll through 190 plus years of proceedings. That's fun. It's a good time. Uh, you will enjoy it at some point. Um, or we have a fantastic book that was published by the Grand Lodge uh, back in the 20s or 30s called From Mouth to Ear. And that lists out a lot of how that over time transpired. Not the work itself, but how the change happened. Um, yeah. How did they? And, and we can only hope that they learned, they heard it correctly from Mouth to Ear, Byron. Because uh, if they had some hard hearing, we can we can scratch our heads on that. And, and honestly, you know, to that point, 
you'll you can find um, in the 30s and 40s <laughs> comments in the committee of on ritual even back when they didn't do a lot of reporting that they'll be like this word in and it's very vague if you, if you know the work you'll figure it out but it'll this word is desire that that word is the and I mean it's literally because probably something very much the whole mouth ear thing worked real well until it didn't and then you had to get the committee together and everybody had to sit there and, and, and hash it out to figure out why or whatnot. Um, let's see here. Um, uh, Stuart English wants to know, was not one of the concerns with the conservators a publication of a cipher? Yes. So the, the conservators, if you're not really familiar with how they worked, uh, Robert Morris, the uh, founder of the Eastern Star, uh, came up with this system of ritual. He said that he had the true web work and, and he had a cipher developed and he would send you a letter and it would tell you how cool you were, how neat you were of a guy, how swell and awesome of a ritualist you were. And if you want to be part of my super, paraphrasing, super great club, sign this letter, send it back to me, I'll get you a cipher and everything you need. Uh, but if you don't want to be part of this club, just destroy it, please. Um <laughs> If you replied to him, he'd give you this cipher. They actually had a mailing list. And the idea was it, for so many years, they were gonna try to basically infiltrate lodges with this cipher and teach that version of the ritual slowly. Because at that time, most Grand Lodges, all Grand Lodges were mouth to ear. So you could easily, with some well-placed brothers, turn tide. Um, it became such an issue that some Grand Lodges, the entire Grand Lodge officer line, were conservators. Missouri took immediate halt to it. Uh, we had an oath you had to take to enter a lodge uh, that caused some situations uh, with other Grand Lodges um, because we wouldn't let you in the room if you're a conservator. Uh, Anthony O'Sullivan, who we mentioned earlier, was extremely active in some of the Grand Yorkite bodies. Uh, while he was visiting the Grand Chapter and Grand Council in Illinois, um, the Grand Lodge of Illinois attempted to pass a resolution barring him from entering into its lodge halls. Um, the deputy Grand Master was a conservator and was not happy about what uh, it did fail. Uh, when Anthony O'Sullivan found out, uh, I, from the general understanding that I have of it, uh, a lot of people showed up at their meeting that were guests from outside the state and didn't like the idea of a guest being <laughs> summarily censured. Um, so there was, a, there was a lot of animosity with the conservators. Uh, but yeah, the production of a cipher, they actually had a conservator's degree. Um, and, and this whole plan was to basically infiltrate your lodges, get this work going and have it take over. Um, and then at the end of their set period of time, they were all going to get together and have a big party. Uh, what is interesting about that? Uh, they published their, all their members. They had a membership list. So you can look and see every Missouri Mason who was a member. Missouri didn't have many. Uh, one of them was Thomas Garrett, uh, later Grand Master. Um, but they published it. Um, and and uh, it kind of followed, uh, it kind of followed Robert Morris around the rest of his life as a bit of a shadow with some people, just because he was meddling in other Grand Lodge's politics and systems. Um, okay. All right. Samuel would like to know, how does our ritual align with English per web? I'm assuming they mean the United Kingdom. And uh, if that's the assumption that I, I'm going to say, we took the train to crazy town. Uh, because in the United States, we're all about standard work. The English, uh, you can have, it can be different town to town. Uh, Preston, now, now that being said, William, or William Preston, of course, created a, a beautiful ritual over there and did very well with it. Um, he got expelled maybe once or twice, uh, started his own version of the Lodge of Antiquity, did some other cool stuff in the mix, but it took off and it is well accepted. It's similar in a lot of ways, but similar, but different. Like we talk about with any grand jurisdiction, but the English don't have a set standardized uniform work across the country. Uh, I don't know, Right Worship with Ty, if you can talk to that or if we've got anybody else on here, you could comment to it briefly. Well, when they were here in St. Louis and we hosted them, one of the things that we discovered that was so interesting 
was that in the second section of the third degree, everything that we actually act out, they discuss. So it's there, but it's there as a soliloquy. So they take you from station to station and discuss the third degree while we are actually acting it out. It was the same at the end, but a very different means to get there. So it was, it was amazing to us. We were really stunned at, at the difference, yet it was still the same. Thank you. Um, but yeah, so it's, it, it's the same but different. We say that a lot about ritual, um, but, but the idea is they don't have a standard work there. That, that's, that is really a big American thing is that idea of uniformity. And, and some of that is a side effect you know, down the road of things like the Morgan Affair and and the, the subtle pushes towards like a general grain lodge and things like that, so. Um. Thank you. Uh, Keith Jacobs wants to know, you commented on the early connections between Missouri and Pennsylvania. Can, can you expand on that early relationship? As a Pennsylvania Mason, I know we have a long history of constituting lodges outside our jurisdiction. So that's an interesting question that again I'll probably defer to Ty on a little bit more. Uh, the first lodge that was in Missouri uh, chartered at St. Genevieve uh, was constituted by the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania um, and, and we see very easily uh, through several accounts early wording, early phrasing, um, practices that are very similar to what is said to be a Pennsylvania habit uh, including the fact that our second section of our third degree is said to be similar to that work. Um, Ty, can you chime into any of that? There was a huge amount of trade between uh, Pennsylvania, particularly Philadelphia and St. Louis. So as that trade developed and those people moved so far west to St. Louis, masonry came with it. So all your early lodges um, were chartered by Pennsylvania. Then after the War of 1812, and those lodges had fairly well fallen into, well, they just weren't there. Uh, the choice really came down to, do we try to revive those lodges and have to pay our per capita that we missed, or do we go to Tennessee and start over again? So that's really how it, it kind of really worked. And also just the distance, the, the pure distance itself. But the early lodges, while they were chartered out of Pennsylvania, what's interesting is that the people who did the chartering in Missouri were actually Virginians. So when you go back east and you see work in Pennsylvania, and then you see work in Virginia, you see a little more Virginia DNA. Thank you. Um, really quickly, just off Facebook here, just scrolling through some of the questions. Uh, Brother Rick Thompson asked uh, where you could get electronic copies of the tonight's presentation. Uh, and this will him into another question too as well, uh, as it's, it's noted um, by most worship brother Hess. Uh, everything you see in tonight's presentation, plus probably another uh, two hours worth of discussion points, um, are going to be included in the Bicentennial History of the Grand Lodge, Volume 2, which will be out sometime in the near future, uh, and brothers will be able to purchase that. Uh, so all this will be in print, and you can go through and redline it and highlight it and draw smiley faces and frowny faces wherever you may like in, in what I wrote. Um, but... We are recording this. We are live streaming to faith, Facebook, so you have that access. If your lodge is, is like uh, to have a presentation on it or something, you can always get a hold of me. We'll put my email address out in the chat later. So, Right, Worshipful Brother Troy Lar or Most Worshipful Brother Hess, do either one of you want to discuss that uh, history of the Grand Lodge of Missouri, Volume 2, and how that's going to be available in the near future? I'd be glad to. Uh, the um, We reprinted the centennial edition of the Grand Lodge, Missouri, that was done in 1821, and then printed a, a companion copy of the bicentennial, the second hundred year history. Uh, it'll be a two volume set. Um, it'll be available uh, through the Grand Lodge. Um, in the near future, we'll be start taking pre orders. Um, for those two volumes, they'll be in a box that'll that'll come in a box set, and the price is going to be fifty dollars, and uh, we'll be able to order them through the Grand Lodge of Missouri. Thank you. Um, 
Most worship book, Tim Thomas mentions that he has a copy of the Missouri Masonic Monitor Illustrated Edition from 1896, which states that it was created under the supervision of Alan McDowell. Grand lecture. Now, what's interesting about that is, and I'll have to go back and recomb it, but I've not seen anything in the proceedings talking about it. Um, and I think that was part of their, does it actually have a preface resolution? Huh. Interesting. Interesting. Um, because they don't really address it other than in late 1908, 1909. And at that point, they're worried about the copyright on it. So I'm kind of interested on how that plugged away. I'll have to dig into that one. Thank you. I'll take a picture and uh, shoot it to you on. Uh, uh, I'd, oh, I'd appreciate that. Yeah, because that's, that's the interesting thing. Uh, this Parsons monitor, it only pops up being mentioned right at the turn of the century. So if it had an earlier mention, they must have buried it with something else in a resolution. Um, that's interesting. Um, and thank you. Thank you. And the other thing to keep in mind, we, we talked about it very briefly, but the funeral services went through a lot of revisions. Um, as some grandmasters said that it was a woeful, sad uh, tome uh, that people thought was over and then started back up again. So uh, it's went through several revisions in itself. Uh, and we can't even really pinpoint on its early popping into a physical form. Philip Moss asks, why does Missouri not recognize traditional observance lodges? The ritual itself does not, is not deviate, does not deviate from the established ritual. I was a charter member of the first TO lodge in Colorado. I default to you, Right Worshipful Sir. And I will default to Right Worshipful Brother Troitlar as the Oh, there's, there's nobody else up there, is there? <laughs> well, most watchful was on the Facebook stream earlier. Um, I have most worshipful brother Hess here, and I have uh, most worshipful brother John Broyles here, who were all through that era. And uh, I think they've taught me well, and uh, we'll see, because I think they may have a few things to say. The concept of the traditional observance lodge at its core has been an issue of exclusionism. And while we are an exclusive body itself, the exclusionism that we detected and that was not allowed before my time was based upon the idea that you can't join because of who you are, meaning you are a plumber you are a craftsman or a tradesman or a car repair person or not a doctor, not a lawyer, not a professor. And that's what was happening. And that's what Missouri or Missouri has not tolerated. We have been very careful to be inclusionary. Every man is judged for himself. It is not what you're wearing or what your title is. It's who you are as a person. And that's why T.O. was not brought into Missouri. Did I get that right, most worshipfuls? Uh, and maybe another reason uh, also was that Missouri required certain things for advancement of the degrees at one time we had a proficiency. And while traditional observance lodges required other things uh, for advancement in degrees like presenting papers and that type of thing. And so it required more um, different qualifications to, to get the second degree or the third degree. And that's why Missouri did not allow those to be formed in our state. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, real quick, right, Worshipful, I've got a question out here on Facebook. Uh, Brother, Th or Brother Thomas Cox says, as an Iowan, I note that our code specifically references the web work as the accepted form. Iowa received its charter from Missouri. Do you think this means Baltimore's web? Reasonably, you could say yes to that. Um, of course, that's the, up to the interpretation of your Grand Lodge and what they see as the web work. Uh, that's, that's the interesting thing there. Uh, our Grand Lodge, it, it, like I said, it's almost systematic. Every two or three years from 1843 onward, <laughs> up until probably about Alan McDowell's tenure as Grand Lecture, you'd have a grand master or a grand lecturer reiterate in their address that Missouri does the Baltimore convention work. 
of Thomas Smith Webb. I mean, they, they tied those two phrases very often together. Um, and our ritual, uh, actually, if you were to go to the Constitution and bylaws, it, it says that the ritual of Missouri is the work as exemplified by the grand lecturer. I believe is how it's phrased. Am I correct or wrong on that one? I believe that is correct. So, correct. And, and so that, that in itself to me is always an interesting thing when you hear it read like that, but that's how it's been phrased for uh, since the point of the Baltimore Convention. And, and part of that is very much, at least in my mind, to the idea that the men that they appointed as grand lecturers right after that convention were guys who learned the web Baltimore work. They were the guys who were boots on the ground. Um, you know, we talked about Carnegie earlier being on that committee that did the ritual uh, revision and, and review. And he's the guy who came back and was the visitor. So the man himself. Uh, you, you can't go from a better source unless you were they were going to dig up Thomas Smith Webb and carry him along with them uh, to that point. So any other questions? All right, I think we've got uh, some great questions here, some great comments. Uh, and I don't know if we have any other any other oddball questions out there at all. I'm going to double check Facebook. I think we've covered all the questions that came in in the chat. There are several comments, mostly saying what a great job you did, right, Worshipful? I don't know Good about job. that. Yeah. Brethren, again, um, for, for my part of this and on behalf of the Masonic Education Committee here, before I turn it over for any closing remarks from Right Worship Brother Kayser, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, this has been one of our longer presentations, but we've had uh, about 40 brothers on Facebook watching us the entire time, and we had a, we've had a good crop of brothers here. Um, next month, the Bicentennial uh, Virtual Lecture Series will host uh, Brother uh, Clifton Truman Daniel. So that will be next month's presentation. Uh, on the final Sunday of the month of January, 2021. Uh, so with that being said, Right Worshipful, I tenure the floor to you. Thank you, Right Worshipful. This would be the point where we would turn things over to the Grand Master. I don't believe he's on the Zoom. I think he uh, uh, probably was watching us on the Facebook Live, so uh, he's not able to give his remarks, but I'm sure he would uh, thank everyone for being here. Once again, thank uh, Right Worshipful Brother Thompson for an excellent presentation. I certainly learned something to, tonight that I didn't know before. Um, and I hope all of the rest of you have. And uh, thank you all for being here. And we look forward to seeing you again next month. So we're going to leave it open for a little while if uh, anybody wants to talk or anything like that. But uh, thank you all. Rick, I just can't take you serious with uh, without the beard. <laughs> Sorry about that. I do take some exception to some of the pictures that I saw of some of the grant lectures.